John and Penny Clough were married in December 1978, and five years later, they are expecting their second child. We were really lucky and we knew it. You know, we'd already got a little boy. We were madly in love. We'd got his own little home and we were having another baby and, you know, lucky enough to get a girl. She was just gorgeous right from day one. John had bought a new camera, took a photo of her and she was looking directly at him. And you felt almost as if, you know, that bond was there between baby and daddy. Even now, it's, it, it can bring a tear to your eye, just thinking about it. Because she grew up in just the most beautiful, loving and caring way. It seemed perfect and we felt probably invincible, you know, that nothing could ruin our little world. As Jane grows up, she excels in school. She was bright academically and we were very, very proud of her. She was always really, really clever. She was a goody-goody. He felt so privileged to have this kid who actually did as she was told, that you'd know would be where she said she would be, uh, that made a mess but tidied up. Oh, it seemed quite unreal, to be honest. Jane has a close relationship with elder brother Pete and younger sister Louise. I think if any of them had any problems that they didn't want to come to mum and dad about, they would go to Jane. She was always there for them. She'd always listen and always make time. I could trust her with anything, absolutely anything. You know, it's, she, uh, she probably, probably knows a few secrets that nobody else knows. You knew that this girl was kind of developing into a, into a woman that would be fantastic, either career-wise or as a mum or whatever. You could see that really shine through. Jane follows in her mum's footsteps and becomes a nurse working in the A&E department. Psychologist Emma Kenny works with victims of domestic abuse in her clinics and has been looking into Jane's character. Jane was absolutely vocational in her caring. It wasn't just about being a nurse, it was about being as good a person as she could possibly be. She volunteered, she would always give up her time when people needed it. There was something intrinsic in her nature that said life was about connecting with other people, caring for other people, and going that little bit further than the average human being does. She reflected that in the way that she acted and the way that she lived and in her chosen career. She was very bubbly. You know, a lovely personality about her. She, she was, she, she was a lovely nurse. So passionate about her job. She, she was a really good role model. She was what a nurse should be. At Blackpool Victoria Hospital, where Jane works, she meets married father of two, ambulance technician Jonathan Vass. He concocts a story to woo Jane about him going through a difficult divorce. Forensic psychologist Dr Kerry Nixon works with Merseyside Police, assessing risk factors in serious violent offenders to help prevent domestic homicide. And she's been looking into Vass's background for this programme. He's a nightclub bouncer, he takes steroids, he's a body lifter. He's got a very macho image and lots of women um, is just another part of that macho image. And also, as he's starting to show his true colours with one woman, he'll start another relationship up with another woman and go through the same cycle, the same pattern. But Jane falls for Vass and takes him home to meet her family. He was a very plausible person. He liked to try and pass himself off as a paramedic, but uh, he was an ambulance technician. He worked in the same area as her. So they had some very common features about their life and experience. And I imagine that Jane also felt that some of his qualities would mirror her just because of his chosen career. And you almost felt sorry for him because he kind of portrayed this illusion that actually um, that his wife was adulterous and he was the hurt party. And, you know, he'd got two little kiddies and all this kind of thing. And, you know, there was part of that where your heart went out to him. And I can see Jane's heart going out to him. Jane believes she's met the man of her dreams. He used to shower with a lot of gifts, um, take on expensive holidays. She was very happy at that point. Um, 
you know, new relationship, you get a buzz inside you, don't you, when that happens. If all domestic abuse perpetrators showed their true colours in the beginning, nobody would fall for them. Um, so they're very charming in the beginning to entice the woman, to get the woman where they want them. It's all part of their control tactics. But the cracks in Vassa's perfect persona soon appear. As he got more involved within our family life, he would trip himself up over to us, not just little lies, but incredible situations where he said his grandma had died, had a house on Baker Street in London, and, you know, he'd, he'd been left an inheritance. Well, I think you kind of think, you know, Baker Street, London, millions. They went away on holiday. Uh, his credit card was maxed out, so Jane had to spend you know, a lot on her card. Inherent lying behaviour, making up stories about his money and inheritances, which car he drives, how much money he earns, very narcissistic traits um, that we see in some offenders. There was just something, I don't know, you call it a gut feeling, that there was something not quite right. Jane's parents' instincts are correct. The truth is, Vass is leading a double life. He had two children by his wife. And he would say that, you know, his wife's going to work, he has duties to go and look after the children while she's at work. And, you know, I think Jane felt good about that, that, you know, he would take in responsibility for his children. But in actuality, he was going back and sharing the marital bed and Jane was a third party. Then we also found out that there was a, a third person in, in his life. Once he started dating Jane, he was already involved in a relationship with another woman and also had other girlfriends as well, so he had numerous relationships. And that's something that I've seen from my research with violent offenders, generally violent offenders. Part of the macho stereotype, I can have any woman I want, makes him feel like a man. But Jane is totally unaware of Vass's other relationships, and very quickly, he moves in with her. It's clear that Jane trusted Vass, but it's at that point we have to remember who Jane is. She's a compassionate, caring, trusting human being from an excellent family. It's in her nature to believe people, and his story is convincing enough to tie her into that belief. In early 2009, a year after the start of their relationship, Jane and Vass reveal they are trying for a baby. To me, the relationship was built on rocky foundations and that he wasn't at all trustworthy, he didn't have integrity. And, um, and then for him to come just a few weeks later and say that he was absolutely shocked that Jane was pregnant, you know, I, I just said, well, you know the facts of life, Johnny. Uh, you know how babies are made, you've already got two. Vass's subsequent change of heart makes Penny even more suspicious of him. I, I found him really quite repulsive at that time. Dr Kerry Nixon believes that getting pregnant to someone like Vass put Jane in danger. Pregnancy is a known risk factor in domestic abuse. Often domestic abuse will either begin or escalate during pregnancy. It's connected to extreme jealousy. So the attention is no longer fully on the man. Vass comes across as a very egocentric character. It's all about him and what he wants with no consideration of other people's feelings. In this case, he's got all the stress of all these multiple relationships ongoing as well. So if we were conducting a risk assessment on Vass, he ticks the majority of the boxes. Vass is a ticking time bomb and he's about to explode. It was one of those things that would just put you even more on your guard against this man. He did not seem to us normal. Generally, if there's severe physical violence in a domestic abuse situation, you very commonly will have sexual assault as well. And all she wanted was love. He, you know, he just couldn't see that. He, all he wanted was control. In 2009, Jane Clough is expecting her first child with boyfriend Jonathan Vass. But Vass is not the man Jane thinks he is, and he starts exhibiting controlling behaviour. He didn't want to see her friends as often. Jane was a very outgoing and sociable person, and he tried to limit that time that she would spend with her families, changing her 
from a bubbly, outgoing girl to somebody that he could control. He would phone her all the time. He would text her. He'd want to know where she was every minute of the day. He, you know, if she met up with friends, uh, you know, he went out to lunch, he'd find out where she was and, and, and appear. You know, he, even if it was out of the way for him, he would just, he was just trying to catch her out. It kind of implied he had no trust in Jane when really it should have been Jane who had no trust in him. Vass's paranoid behaviour takes a more sinister turn. Jane came to us one day and said Vass had been going through a very private things, things that she kept in a special box. We knew she'd had this box for years as a, as a little girl growing up, where she put her private mementos, little letters or whatever, and he'd gone through that. He'd found photographs of her with old boyfriends where he'd actually torn them in half and torn the old boyfriend up. And uh, to us, you know, we were just aghast that he could do that. It just seemed far too intrusive. It, it was one of those things that would just put you even more on your guard against this man. He did not seem to us normal. Vass's paranoia may have been the result of his use of steroids, and the pressure of maintaining his other lives is tipping him over the edge. The multiple relationships which we see in the backgrounds of violent offenders, generally the macho image who's leading a double life. So that would probably, for anybody, have an element of stress on top of everything else. Add the steroid use on top of that, and you created a monster. Six foot three and 17 stone, bodybuilder Vass begins taking his anger out on Jane. At this point, during the pregnancy, at Jane's most vulnerable, most needy, and most fragile, Vass becomes violent with her. Hitting her, keeping the marks in a position where they weren't readily visible, so if you'd wear long sleeve jumpers to cover her arms. But to spare their feelings, Jane hasn't told her parents the full extent of the abuse she suffers at the hands of Vass. But by this point, Jane has built up a relationship with a man that she believes she loves and trusts and has created a life. She's in an incredibly difficult scenario right now. According to Dr. Kerry Nixon, the areas Vass assaults reveal the true extent of the domestic abuse Jane is suffering. If the violence is actually directed to the stomach area, it could be that they are jealous of potentially suspecting that the baby isn't theirs. Whereas in this case, um, with Jane, we know that the injuries were directed to her face. So this suggests, in this case, that it was part of ongoing domestic abuse. It's just horrifying to know that this man, well, alleged man, has hit her so hard that it's marked her. Courageously, Jane decides to report Vass for assault. She went to the police, but because of the implications of what it would have on his career, she decided not to take the charges forward. But she kept the evidence. It's understandable that in spite of the violence that begins, until that point, he has been what she considers a good partner and a good parent. And that undoubtedly is what she's hoping will return. She still wanted to be in a relationship with this man, even though he was abusing her now. Um, she still felt that she could get that nice Jonathan Vaz back from the early weeks of the relationship. And uh, really, it was all a, a scam. She was never going to get the nice Jonathan Vaz because the nice Jonathan Vaz didn't exist. We told Jane that he wasn't welcome here anymore. Vass promises to change and agrees to seek professional help for his violent temper. He decided to go to his family doctor together and the family doctor referred them for counselling. He only appeared at one session of the anger management, never went again but use the excuse of going to the sessions to go and take part in his other lives. But without anger management, Vass's violent behaviour continues. Dr Kerry Nixon believes where there is domestic violence in a relationship, there is often another dark taboo. 
violence escalates in their relationship, which again is very typical in this type of domestic abuse situation. It's very much a violent control situation. Generally, if there's severe physical violence in a domestic abuse situation, you very um, commonly will have sexual assault as well. In November 2009, a few weeks after the birth of her baby daughter, Jane accuses Vass of raping her in text messages. You have hurt, raped and reduced me to tears on countless occasions. I'm scared of you. Chillingly, Vass replies, we are staying together regardless of our problems. In another message, Jane says, I love you, Johnny, but I don't feel safe with you anymore. Vass replies, I love you too, but why run to your parents? I'm not going to kill you. On the 29th of November 2009, Jane telephones the police, alleging Vass has raped her in front of their six-week-old daughter. It's interesting that it's at that point of the alleged rape that Jane uh, seeks to end the relationship. Very often, when somebody aggresses a person in front of their child, it changes the way that they feel about that individual. Something shifts in Jane's mentality and she recognises that she needs to escape and that he needs to be brought to justice. I think it became clear to Jane that not only was she at incredible risk from this man and he was not going to change, uh, but baby was at risk as well. I was so thrilled when she reported him to police uh, and decided to take it further. Jane makes lengthy emotional statements to the police about the alleged rapes, and Vass is charged with nine counts of rape, one of sexual assault, and three counts of common assault. He is remanded in custody, and Jane reveals what's happened to her devastated parents. I don't think you can imagine what, what, what it's like as a parent, kind of imagining what your daughter's come through, because you do. Um, the hurt, the pain, uh, the fact that he was so big and muscly and she was so petite. Um, I, you, you just felt like you wanted this man locked up, you know, uh, and for her to be safe. It sickened you that this person had such a lovely, beautiful girl and he could have had such a good life with her. And all she wanted was love. But he, you know, he just couldn't see that. He, all he wanted was control. As a dad, you cringe to the core. It's just such a horrible concept that your daughter can be abused in such an intrusive and violent way. You know, we're, we're a, a nice family. Things like this don't happen to us. You know, you read about this in the paper, it always happened to someone else. And then, you know, lo and behold, you have first-hand experience, first-hand knowledge of someone that you love so deeply, who's been hurt so badly. It's horribly, you know, imagine yourself hearing that about your sister, like, it's... It's disgusting, it is, you know? How, how dare he do these things to Jane? You, know, it was, you feel so helpless. You feel angry enough to do something stupid. But you know the police are involved, you know, that he's going to be dealt with and you put your faith then into the system. Jane has dared to stand up to Vass, and he doesn't like it. In prison, Vass is plotting revenge. He was very egocentric, so he wouldn't have blamed himself for putting himself in prison. He would have blamed Jane. It was Jane's fault that he was there. Not his own fault for abusing Jane and being put in prison, but Jane's fault for putting him there. But to Jane and her family's horror, Vass is released on bail. 
for him to be let go on bail was horrendous. Uh, and, and the conditions of bail were just ludicrous words. Vass's bail conditions say he's not to contact Jane or enter the borough of Burnley and Pendle where Jane lives. Judge Simon Newell has since released a statement explaining his decision to grant Vass bail. At no stage was there any evidence presented to the court that Mr Vass was likely to commit further offences against Jane. Vass was a paramedic of previous good character. For the Clough family, this is terrifying. Jane has recognised how dangerous he is, how threatening he is, and she is also aware now that she has a daughter to protect. You could see the fear in Jane's face. She couldn't believe it. I think she'd been so expecting him to be held. It's unimaginable to consider knowing that the man who has abused and harmed you has been free to walk the streets and has access to your whereabouts. For anybody, this is a terrifying experience. With Vass walking the streets, Jane becomes a prisoner in her own home. Terrified of him killing her, she predicts that he will seek revenge. Seven months later, tragically, she is proven right. She expresses consistently through her writing that she fears that this is the law before the storm and that he is coming for her. She said that she's scared that he's, he'll come and get her. I remember saying, how, how's he gonna come and get you? And, and they were my words and I thought I eat those words now. Someone came to shout me that someone had been stabbed outside. You have a daughter, Jane. We believe she's been murdered. In December 2009, Jonathan Vass is released on bail after being charged with nine counts of rape, one sexual assault, and three counts of common assault on the mother of his baby, Jane Clough. He would have come out extremely angry um, at Jane for doing that to him. Because from his um, narcissistic, egocentric way of looking at it, she, it was all her fault that he was there, not down to his own actions. Vass's release is Jane and her family's worst nightmare. It began months of fear for them all. Jane became the prisoner and he had his freedom. It was the wrong way around. Our house became like a fortress. All the doors locked. You did look out of the window if somebody came to the door. You're checking to see who it is. We felt the threat was very real and we could see it, you know. We knew that he would do something. Jane knew that he would do something. She was frightened to go back to her own house. So it became very important to us to do what we could to protect her. Yeah, she was a wreck. All I could do was, you know, be a big brother to her. You know, you could tell uh, that she hadn't slept. She would say that she's not slept. You could tell that she'd been crying. Jane begins writing a diary where she describes her feelings towards Vass and her fears over what he would do to her. Just goes through the fear that she had, basically knowing that he was going to get her one way or another. I'm worried Johnny is going to do something stupid like try and find me. Time is running out for him. She sees that he's going to be building in frustration and anger and resentment, and she worries that because he knows that there is a court date and he has to possibly go to prison, and in fact it seems that she expected him to go to prison, she feels that there is an opportunity for him to cause her great harm. In March 2010, Jane writes, What plan is he hatching? I don't believe he'll just sit back and let a jury find him guilty. He's not going to let them send him back to prison and I can't help thinking he'll get his revenge on me. Research tells us that if a victim says that they're afraid, if they feel that they are in danger, they often are. I've been worried today about Johnny coming to get me, even killing me if he gets found guilty when he's released, awaiting sentencing. What would stop him? He's probably going to blame me. We are under no illusion here that she has been growing in her understanding of this man's capacity for harm and capability. In fact, she expresses consistently through her writing that she fears that this is the law before the storm and that he is coming for her. 
as well as writing her fears down, Jane confides in her family. She said that she's scared that he's, he'll come and get her. I remember saying, how, how is he going to come and get you? And, and they were my words, and I you know, thought I eat those words now. In the spring of 2010, Jane spends days with police, making statements, determined to build up the strongest case possible against Vass. Slowly, with the support of her family, Jane grows in confidence, and there are signs her life is getting back on track without Vass. I think it would have been so easy to back out and not go to court, but I think she felt so strongly that he had to answer for what he'd done to her. Realising Jane is not going to back down, Vass confides in one of Jane's colleagues that if he gets found guilty, he will kill Jane. The colleague passes this off as bravado. He knew that she wasn't going to back down and that things were going to go ahead and she was going to have a day in court. It seems that he was driven by a hatred of Jane following what she, in his mind, had done to him. So she had alleged this rape. She had put him in prison. It was her fault that he was in this situation, and she had to pay for that. Jane returns to work in the summer of 2010, but in the first few weeks, she has a colleague walk with her from the car park into the hospital, as she still feels uneasy being on her own. There is no sign of Vass. On the 25th of July, 2010, at around 7 p.m., Jane leaves her nine-month-old daughter at her parents' home and makes her way to Blackpool Victoria Hospital for her shift. On that evening, Jane parked in a car park, um, probably about 100 yards from the main entrance the hospital where she was working. We believe Jonathan Vass was waiting for her. It would appear that Jane's gotten out of her car, has walked across the car park. She appears to have stopped. We believe that Jonathan Bass has called her back over and she's turned around to speak to him. We don't know what happened in that conversation. That isn't covered by CCTV, but we do know then that he brutally attacked her. A&D nurse Mandy Futrell is one of the first on the scene. Someone came to shout me that someone had been stabbed outside. He embarked on a frenzied attack, repeatedly stabbing her over 70 times. It was a brutal attack. She was heavily bloodstained. He forced her towards the back of her car, and we believe some of the attack occurred there. Then he calmly walked away and then went back and slit her throat to make sure that he'd actually killed her. This wasn't a killing of passion. This was an act of revenge. She had dared to cross him, and he would make sure that she paid the ultimate price. We received uh, Jane into the resource area, and. Um, that's when um, that's when we, we worked on her. <laughs> she had no signs of life. She was in cardiac arrest. She'd lost a lot of blood, so we we got blood into her very quickly. Um, but we had to declare her that she'd she died. That's when we found a uniform in a bag and the, we realised who it was through her name. She was due to start her shift with her friends. She was so badly injured that they did not recognise her for some considerable period of time and it was a great shock and they were greatly traumatised when they finally realised that it was her and what they were dealing with. It must have been horrendous for them. I said, Let, let's just see, let's just, let's have a look at her, let's make sure it's Jane. And of course it was. The shock of it was just enormous. There was just an air of sadness all the time, just like a hole missing. A few hours after the attack, the police are at the Clough's house with devastating news. Was, uh knock on the door, and there's a police officer there. I think your heart almost sinks because you know it's not going to be good news, and to us it was the worst news. You have a daughter, Jane. 
we believe she's been murdered. She's been killed. Oh, gosh, it sounds awful. You have that tiny, tiny hope that it might have been somebody else, which is awful. But you know in your heart, if they're coming to you and saying they think it's Jane, and she works at that hospital, you know it's Jane. Not me, it's just your heart. You lose your breath, it takes your breath away. It's not physical pain, but it's emotional pain, and there's nothing you can do about it. It just hurts so much. And you know who's done it, you know, from, from seeing what's happened, you know who's responsible. There's no Anybody else who would have even thought of it, who could have done it, I don't think. The only person who ever hurt Jane was Vaz, so towards it was a natural conclusion. Meanwhile, Vass is on the run, and he's targeting Jane's family home. Around six o'clock the following morning, Jonathan Vass turned up at the home address of Jane's parents. Armed police are there to greet him. We just heard Pete shouting. He's here, he's here. It's sort of parked in the middle of the road and approached the house. And two women police officers had tried to arrest him. Uh, and in his mature way, he said, only male officers. So they tasered him and brought him down. I think he'd come to kill the baby. And I don't think he could ever, to be honest, stand us supporting Jane. I think it miffed him that he couldn't break us as a family. And I, I think he really had very harmful intentions. We were too strong for him as a family. When police search Vass's car, they find matches and full cans of petrol in his boot. We believe that he come to torch the place with us all in it. He was so consumed by anger that he wasn't thinking straight anyway. His baby, you know, he hated Jane. He hated her parents. He blamed everybody else apart from himself for what had happened. It's Jane's fault this is happening. It's her parents' fault. They pulled her away from me. And his child is just another and another victim. A few days after Jane's murder, on her dad, John's 50th birthday, they have to identify their beloved daughter's body. I wanted to see her. In fact, I wanted to see her injuries, but um, the police didn't want us to see her injuries. She looked very peaceful. You could, you, uh, you could obviously tell it was Jane. And you could just see, uh, she had beautiful brown eyes. You could just see her, her brown eyes kind of peeping through her eyelashes. I just kissed her, told her I loved her. And basically that the bastard couldn't hurt her anymore. But I was angry. While under arrest, Vass admits killing Jane but shows no remorse for his actions. Jonathan Vass, uh, in my opinion, is a bully. Um, he didn't show any remorse at all throughout this process. The only comment he'd ever made was, I did it, and I think he made one, one sentence in the whole time we interviewed him. Um, as I said, he's a bully. He couldn't cope with the fact that Jane was standing up to him, was gonna go through with his court case. He could see his life in ruins and he decided to take this dreadful action to try and end it. I have no sympathy at all for Jonathan Vass. He is uh, the maker of his own misfortune. It's a nightmare that your family shouldn't have to go through because you know that Jane shouldn't have had to go through that. How can it be when you report rape that you end up dead? You know, there's something wrong. Vass is charged with Jane's murder and the trial is set for October 2010. In prison, if you're a rapist, you want to step above a paedophile. 
to me it was so important that Vaz was that rapist. On October the 7th, 2010, at Preston Crown Court, 30-year-old Jonathan Vass pleads guilty to the brutal murder of his ex-girlfriend, 26-year-old nurse Jane Clough. Scum. So it's scum. I think he's despicable. I think he needs to be in prison for life. And I think he needs to be tried as a rapist. And as the way things stand at the moment, he isn't even on the sex offenders list. I want him to know we're going to try and make that happen. His lack of feeling is very indicative of antisocial personality traits, very indicative. He shows absolutely no remorse, no remorse whatsoever. It's cold and calculated. A week later, Vass is sentenced to life imprisonment and ordered to serve a minimum of 30 years. The judge describes it as a brutal and callous murder for which Vass has shown no remorse. But to the horror of Jane's parents, the judge says in court that because Vass pleaded guilty to the most serious crime in the criminal calendar, murder, the rape charges are to remain on file. Jane had done something very incredible. She'd tried to get out of a domestic abuse relationship. She'd tried to keep herself safe, her baby safe, go through the court system and get this man made accountable for the crimes he committed. And then when you hear that a judge is going to actually let him off with the rapes because he's pleaded guilty to murder. It, it's like you've been stabbed. Jane's parents ideally want closure, and that closure occurs when Vass is tried for rape. That was the reason that he killed their daughter. And in many ways, as far as they're concerned, Jane deserves that dignity to have been acknowledged as a victim of rape. This is the case that I talk about in my research when I look at domestic homicides. The risk factors were there, the warning signs were there. It's a preventable case, and she still was killed. And that's what makes it so sad. It just sent out the wrong message to anybody wanting to report rape and to the people who do rape. Uh, because in prison you're treated far better by your other prisoners as a murderer, because you're the big man. Uh, in, you know, whereas if you're a rapist, you want to step up above a paedophile. To me, it was so important that Vaz was that rapist. Since Vaz was sentenced, John and Penny have campaigned for justice for Jane, determined to change the bail laws which would stop people like Vass being released to commit further crimes. They have campaigned for the prosecution to have the right to appeal if the accused is granted bail. We look back to the day of that bail hearing when we think Jane's death was preventable. I think she would have expected us to look at what happened and try and make changes so that it couldn't happen again. We are a voice now, uh, and that's why, really, we've become campaigners, to make things different for the victims, and that's what Jane would have done. It's given us a reason to get out of bed uh, and to carry on with life, because it would have been easy not to. In February 2012, John and Penny are invited to the House of Lords to see their bail amendment passed. I've had the humbling privilege of meeting this morning Jane's parents, John and Penny Clough. It got cross-party support and went through. It was quite an honour to be there. If this house were given to standing ovations, they would be greeted with such an ovation today. I think it was a momentous thing to do knowing that it's going to be there to protect other victims, but I think we both felt very deeply the cost. Yeah. Why we were doing it, it's because we've lost Jane. And uh, so on one hand, you're feeling up there because you've done it, but on the other hand, you're feeling down there because you, you've done it because your daughter's been yeah. murdered. Yeah. I'm very proud of them. I can't, can't believe how much you know, hard work they've done. It's fantastic. They continue Jane's legacy, being caring, compassionate, good human beings who continue to fight even with such adversity.
And in July 2012, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Keir Starmer, says that in cases where an offence as serious as rape is alleged in the context of a subsequent murder, the Crown Prosecution Service should persist with the rape charges. He said, leaving charges such as rape to lie on file will now become the exception, not the rule. The admiration I think the whole country has got for them is, is massive. Uh, I feel very lucky that my mum and dad. And I think they'd have done the same for any of us. But for her family and those who love Jane, the hole she's left behind is immense. Probably one of the best nurses we've had. Shining star. <laughs> A beautiful, loving, caring girl that everyone's going to miss. I just can't bring myself to remember my phone. Because I still expect her to keep ringing me and texting me. <laughs> I'd look forward to a meeting the right man and being able to walk her down the aisle and give her away to someone who deserved her. And I'll never get to do that. You know, I've seen my mum and dad sometimes and, you know, the pain that they're feeling, it, you know, it's different to mine. It's their daughter, she was, she was my sister. It's, it's heartbreaking. It makes you mad. It, it's it's that kind of realization that this person isn't going to walk through the door again and make you laugh and smile. That you can't give her a hug. That she can't give you a hug. Um, and just have that ongoing relationship that we should still be having. I do feel a strong guilt that you know I'm her dad. She's my baby and. I'm supposed to be there to protect her. And I couldn't help her, I couldn't protect her. There's times when I can feel myself floating above the car park and the, you know, watching what's happened, seeing it all in detail and not being able to do anything. It's, it's something that traumatizes you and it will be with us for the rest of our lives. But after more than 30 years of marriage, John and Penny are determined the murder of their beautiful and beloved daughter won't destroy their family. He's always been my best friend. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Same here. Oh, yeah. thank you, Cluffy. Um, yeah, we've always been there for one another. We've had such a strong marriage and such a strong family that it will take a lot more than something Jonathan Bass can do to us to separate us. We still love one another, don't yeah. we? And I don't know, love finds a way. We will get through this and I'm not saying we'll be better for it. That's the wrong word. We'll, we'll get back to how Jane saw us.